proportions, we're going to use the Z distribution. Very nice. Very nice. If you're going to estimate means, what are you going to use? Do you have to memorize formulas for these things? Good Lord, no. Do you have to use your TI for them? You don't, you don't have to. You have to use, I would use technology in general. There are, there are, you can go online and use Google calculators. Just Google one proportion confidence interval calculator and you'll have 100,000 hits. Hmm. That's too much. You can, you, I'm, not saying you, I'm not saying you can't use your TI. I'm just saying you don't have to use your TI. My TI does things like calculate sample sizes and whatnot for you. There is a, hmm, there is a sample size calculation for averages. So let's, let's, let's make a quick recap before we move on. So if you're estimating parameters, let's just put this together. If you're estimating parameters, there's only two that we're going to talk about estimating in this class. And it's the same two parameters we're going to talk about all class. Little p and little mu. That's it. If you want to estimate little p, or if you want to estimate little mu. That's it. There's other ones you can estimate as well, but I don't see the need of, of talking about them because nobody seems to do it in the real world. They estimate these two. So as far as estimating a little p, you have to do p hat and its margin of error. And the idea is that little p is going to be p hat minus the margin of error and p hat plus the margin of error 95% of the time. Or in Carly's case, 99% of the time. That's what I'm talking to <laughs> That's the idea. That is the idea. Same as mu. Mu is going to be centered around his or her margin of error. Or excuse me, I shouldn't say that. Mu is going to be 95% of the time within a confidence interval that's centered around x bar's margin of error. As far as the calculations of those margins, you've seen them both calculated once now, manually. You'll never do it again. I just don't want you to. It gets tedious. It gets tedious. So 95% of the time, whatever we're looking for is going to be stuck between these these two measurements based on the sample data. So th this is based on sample data, that's based on sample data, that's based on sample data, that's based on sample data. And 95% of the time, what you're looking for is somewhere between them. And that's powerful. That's very, very powerful. A question that comes up often is how big a sample do I need? And we started addressing this back in 243 when you guys were appalled that Gallup was doing studies on 2,000 Americans and saying that it was good enough. Like, how can that be good enough? There's like 310 million Americans. How can you ask 2,000 of them and be okay with that? And hopefully now you understand. After running the math, you can solve the margin of error for a sample size. And it tells you exactly what you need. And 2,000 is generally more than enough if all you want to be is 95% confident and you can, you can be okay being off by like two or three percentage points. I gave you a tool in the TI, the sample size calculator, to work for that. But the only... The only one that works for is if you're trying to estimate this guy, the sample size calculator. That sample size, here's the formula in case you don't have the program or don't want to use it. It's 0.25 times z squared over the margin of error squared. Okay, that's, that's your sample size calculator. If if you don't, for some reason, don't want to use the program I gave you, or if you lose it, or if you erase it late at night and you don't feel like going and Googling it, that's fine too. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a formula for the sample size of, of mu? Yes, of course, it would be awesome if you could have a sample size for, for a calculator for mu. The problem is you can't. If you think about where this came from, it came from the margin of error calculation. And the margin of error for a single little proportion guy is that z multiplied by this guy. Don't memorize this. You can just look at it right now. We solve that to get that. Right? If you solve that algebraically, you get that. If you're interested, I put the video of me solving that in two parts on the, in the extra resources page of your, of your schedule. If you're interested. You might not be. That's totally fine, too. The problem is, if you look at the margin of error over here, the margin of error for this guy, you've probably already forgotten it from Tuesday, and that's okay. It's that t multiplier times little s over root n. So the problem is, you can solve that for n. You totally can. 
We absolutely can. I mean, it's actually easier to solve that guy for n than it is to solve the other one for n because there's fewer variables involved. The problem is the fact that that is t. What does t depend on as one of its only variables? To the negative. Yes, n. It depends on n. So you really can't ever sub supply a value of t because you have to know how large your sample size is. Well, if you're doing a calculation based on sample size, you don't know what your sample size is. That's what you're looking for. So in other words, when I ask you over here, how confident do you want to be, and you say 95% or 99% or 90%, as soon as you make that statement, you know what z is. If you're 95% confident, that's 1.96. If you're 99% confident, that's 2.575. If you're 90% confident, that's 1.645. You know the number that is attached to that confidence. The problem with the t distribution is, if I tell you 95% confidence, you can't just say, oh, it's then it's bleh. The next question you have to ask is, what's your sample size? Because then it varies depending on sample size. So I tend to just ignore the idea of sample size calculation, although textbooks will have a fictitious formula for it. I tend to ignore it. And we, we talk about it in a more realistic light later in the course, when it becomes a measurement of type 2 error, when we actually try to mitigate what's called type 2 error versus type 1 error. But finally, we can talk to Carly about your 99% confidence and why sometimes we don't want to go there. Because type 2 error is sometimes we don't want to go there. We'll get into that today, though. So is that OK as a recap? So you've got your TI can do this for you automatically. Your job is to interpret it. Your TI's program can do this for you, which is nothing to interpret. Just go out and get that many responses. I do want to say one thing about this, though, for those of you going into research fields. Suppose you run your sample size calculation, and it tells you you need 2,000 respondents. So you set up an experiment. You go, OK, here we go. 2,000 people. I got 2,000 people on the roll. Run the experiment. Why might you be in trouble? Realistically speaking, not statistically speaking. Realistically speaking, why might you be in trouble? If they don't show up or if they don't finish the, the trick. How many of you guys, when you get junk mail in your mailbox, read it? How many of you just throw it directly away? Very often, what you've thrown away sometimes are surveys done by companies trying to get information from you. They know that. They know that there's like a 5% response rate on like mail surveys or email surveys or things like that. So they know if they need 2,000 respondents, they know they've got to ask like 100,000 to get that 2,000. You see what I'm getting at there? You've got to over ask to get what you need minimally. You might get more. You might get more. That just shrinks your margin of error down. But in order to get the minimal that you need, you very often have to over, over survey or over uh, queue or query your, uh, your, your population. Does that, does that make sense? It's outside the scope of the course. The course just says you need 2,000. Done. But research method-wise, realize you may have to go after more. I deal with this all the time when I work with PhD students. I started with 64. I've got five left. I'm screwed. You're not screwed. It took a wide margin of error. That's all. We have to adjust our studies. You can do math on a small sample. You just not, might, might not be able to do the math you wanted to do originally. Does, does that make sense? And we've got tools for that, too. Your third project, we deal with how to deal with a very small, very skewed sample size and still get meaningful data from it. I mean, you can do it. It's not always easy. And it's not in most textbooks, but we will, we'll get to it. Yes? So there's our recap of estimating parameters. Yes, good stuff. I want to see how that ties into our world now, yes? Yes, I think so. How are we feeling? How are we feeling? 